Hello, welcome to Furious Driving, and you join me today at the wheel of perhaps the ultimate Ford Sierra, the X, oh no, not an XR, sorry, the 2.9 litre 4x4 gear. I keep thinking it's an XR 4x4, but it's not, it's the comfy one. This car is actually for sale right now at the Percival Motor Company near Lenham in Kent. So check out the link in the description below to their website. And if you like reviews on this kind of offbeat, retro, unusual car, then please do hit the subscribe button, which is down there, and the bell notification to find out when more reviews are on the way. Now let's get on with talking about the Sierra. Hello, welcome to Furious Driving, and today we're out in another Hugh Barnson designed classic Ford. This time the Sierra, and not just any Sierra, because this is the ultimate Sierra. Not only is it a wagon, an estate, not only is it a V6, a 2.9 no less, this one is four wheel drive. This is as good as Sierras get, and to top it all off completely, the best of the best of the best, it's got headlight wipers. This thing is peak 1980s. Now it's incredible to think that work began on something as modern looking as the Sierra way back in 1978 under the project name Project Tony. And that's Tony with an I. Presumably with a little smiley face over the I as well because you know, Tony with an I has always got that. But then by 1981, the name was changed to Sierra. And that meant the end of the Cortina and the Taunus names in Britain and the rest of Europe. And that was 45 years of those previous names gone in a moment, and in comes the Sierra, the new dawn. Now already, the Mark III Escort had appeared and shown the world the new swooping hatchbacky modern aerodynamic style, but still, people were used to the Cortina and its very three box square angular look, and so the shock of the new was significant. When people saw the Sierra for the first time, and initial sales were a little bit slow, people were, re were kind of reticent to move over this weird new alien jelly mold thing that had been dropped on them. They didn't like at first. So it was revealed at the NEC Motor Show in Birmingham 1982, followed by the Paris Motor Show, and then actually put on sale in 1983, but they still managed to register 11,000 Cortinas in Britain alone in 1983, which is a lot of old stock being discounted, we imagine, but also a lot of people who weren't ready for something quite so different. However, in the first full year of sales, they managed to get rid of 160,000 of these in the UK alone. And over in Germany, in the first full year of sales, it outsold the Taunus by a matter of three to one of the previous sales figures. So they had struck a right chord somewhere along the line, even though it was new, avant-garde, contemporary, exciting, aerodynamic, blobby. It was different, but people were getting used to it pretty quickly. And now looking back, it has become an absolute icon of the 80s. People of my generation, they were more younger than me, they will look more fondly at the Sierra than they will at a Cortina. Personally, though, I would, I would certainly rather have a Sierra over a Cortina if I was buying one as a classic. So while some people were lamenting the death of the three box saloon and the demise of the Cortina, they had to wait until 1987 for the facelift and the Sapphire to bring back a three box standard four door. Meanwhile, the Sierra was plodding on as a five door hatchback. It wasn't until 1986 they brought out an estate. However, in the meantime, back in 1985, they had gone all four x four, the XR four x four, no less, which had a pair of viscous differentials sending power to both axles with a two thirds power split to the rear axle, making it feel more like a rear wheel drive car still. And those are marketed as the XR4, the XR4x4, those kind of XR based names. So in 1986, they threw together the best bits of everything, the estate, the four wheel drive, and the comfy interior from the gear. So we've got the 2.9 4x4 gear. Now, on a car made almost entirely of good bits, this is one of the good bits. Originally, it was a Cologne 2.8 V6 with the Bosch K-Jetronic mechanical fuel injection, which, as you know, I've had some fun with, and it can be a bit of a nightmare. When it works, it's fantastic, but the moment it goes wrong, suddenly you're in for a world of pain. However, the car got updated and it gained the 2.9 litre V6 Cologne, but this time with EFI, electronic fuel injection, for a bit more reliability, stability, and a bit more power. Grr. And looking around at all the various mod cons of this car, we've not only got power steering, of course, we've got air conditioning on this car as well. This is modern motoring in a bygone age. Well, a retro age. Now chalk this up to another. Ugh. You don't need an SUV, you need an estate car. If you want practical and go anywhere, apart from being four-wheel drive, as we've already mentioned numerous times, look at the size of this boot. You can fit a dozen donkeys in the back of this thing. Little lash down points which holding the carpet down, underneath which we'll find a lovely solid metal floor. And if we, if we delve underneath this, we'll find a full size alloy spare wheel. Wow, that's surprisingly heavy. I'm going to put it down. 
And on the other side, bear in mind this is a second metal floor. This isn't just a bit of tar board or something. We've got stowage for our toolkit. And of course, the seats fold down so you can have an enormous load of space in there. Take a wardrobe home, be an antique dealer if you really want to. Now, you'll notice we have got a pop-up sunroof before we climb in and roof rails and roof bar things. So you can have all manner of rooftop accessories and stuff for making this car as practical as a car can possibly be. And it's not an SUV, so it's a sensible height for lifting things onto as well. Go at state cars. Check out these 1980s door handles as found on many of the Ford products. Textured hard plastic and a funny little weird key thing. Climb inside and we have got all of the velour a velouri soft door card, heavy plastic moulded door handle and these typical 1980s Ford rocker locks which are kind of curious to use, a bit Japanesey. Then we have more carpeting in this lovely texture, armrest and then a door pocket because it's 1980 so it's hard plastic. But there is a speaker, speaker in the doors moving into the future days and this standard Ford item. This is like Where's Wally or I Spy in Ford car component thing because this little mirror adjuster is in so many vehicles going back for so many years. Now let's climb inside and see what else we can spot from the Ford parts bin that make this car special and different. Now 1980s Sierras you forget just how angular the dashboard is. You kind of think they're going to be a bit curvy like the outside but really they are not. You do feel that you've stepped back about five years earlier than the outside of the car when you climb in because this is just an array straight line after straight line after straight line. It's almost Art Deco inspired by that respect. So we have got in front of us a big square binnacle which is slightly offset to the wheel because we've got the vertical heater controls on the left hand side. Then we've got the instruments themselves, the rev counter which is unusually not the same pattern as the speedometer. Normally you've got them both doing a complete circle or a, or a semicircle, whatever, one mirrors the other. But in this case, no, we've got a semicircular arc redlining at 5750. Then we've got the full circle of speed on the right hand side. In the middle, we have got our fuel and our temperature. All very simple, basic stuff. On the right hand side, opposite our heater controls, we have got this panel of many, many buttons. The 80 was the era of many buttons because cars suddenly got lots of functionality, lots of things to do, but they hadn't got touch screens which take too many things away. So everything has a button of its own. So rear and front screen heaters, this has got this hasn't got quick clear, but it has got a front screen clear button, big air vent, and a grill for another loudspeaker, so possibly different uh, trim level head speakers here underneath the, the steering wheel. Then we have a sensibly placed hazard warning light switch with a repeater up here, so I wonder if this car had a tow bar at some point in its life. Then these little tiny delicate stalks, which you forget Ford's had for so long. These are such little delicate items you can't believe they haven't broken after so long. And on the right hand side, instead of having a dial for your lights, you've got this further away, slightly smaller, clicky uppy stalk in front of the wipers. And hidden, almost completely hidden by these very dainty stalks, are these rotating dials, these drums. One for the brightness of the dashboard, the other one appears to be the variable speed of your flick wipe. That's curious. Now we've got a leather steering wheel, a rather shiny leather steering wheel uh, with nice perforated areas. The car's only done 46,000 miles so it's all fairly unworn on the wheel. And we've got the horn. That's a very parpy horn. Hot oh, parpy appears to be my new word for hornage. A couple of things to note underneath the steering wheel. We have got the Ford standard open the uh, bonnet instead of adjusting your steering wheel control down here. Always such a confusing place. Then we've got a large area for items, room for activities in this little area down here. And hidden, hidden to the left of the wheel, we've got this little felty uh, coin and I don't know what else holder. Hide your chewing gum down there. Who knows? Now we've got more vents in this area which stacks away. It's all just stacked areas of straight lines. Vents at the top, nice little pictogram showing what's going on if I turn the ignition on you'll see a quick flash of everything being checked and then it'll go to tell me that my uh, driver's door is open. I'll turn that off again. Then we've got our clock, which is very modern, digital. Underneath that, we'll look at this radio. We are in a, what Ford model is this? Doesn't tell me. This is the standard, I assume, original Ford radio cassette. Not auto reverse, just reverse. 
I do remember these radios so well. Fond memories of that light green color. And then next to that, we've got the controls for the fan itself. And this is your air conditioning control. So whether it's basic fan or actual air conditioning, one way or the other on the fan, that's an interesting alternative to having an on off switch for the AC. Now under that, there is a blanking plate because on some cars, there would be something else. And on this one, there is another cubby hole because Ford did offer so many audio options. So you'll notice these are three DIN slots. The bottom one has got an ashtray in it, but you could have had, if you're paying enough money, an amplifier in one slot, a graphic equalizer in another. I think later on there was even a CD player as a separate complete radio sized unit. So you could customize your own like, hi-fi stack in your dashboard. Uh, here we also have ash the cigarette lighter 12 volt socket. And we do of course have the ashtray down there. Over to the left, there's not an airbag, but it's a panel that looks like it could be an airbag, but we're too many years too early. I didn't mention though, the T-shelf is not a bad T-shelf. It's quite narrow, so we need small sticks. Ideally, maybe something like uh, Cadbury's chocolate fingers laid end to end will be our snack of choice in this car. Then moving left, we have got this large speaker grill area again, but probably not speakers because we've got door speakers and a very narrow, surprisingly narrow glove box. Now moving back, we five-speed manual gearbox. This is a good thing in my book. It's a robust, solid, chunky, notchy Ford gearbox, which we know is gonna be good stuff and not let us down. Uh, behind that, we've got all four electric windows because this is a gear, so everything is electric, everything is velour. And so we even had the electric mirrors on the other side. And behind the real handbrake, like a real handbrake, we've got a nice cassette rack here in the armhole armrest. So we'll keep our... We'll keep our audio tape safe and rattle free. Now, before we move into the back of the car, look at these seats. This interesting double sculpting situation going on in the seat backs. A little bit of a bucket seat, but a little bit of an armchair as well. And there's a nice round curvy heading into the 90s and the mini curves of the 90s look going on with uh, the headrest and all, all of the velour and these little tiny I don't know, little space invader patterns or tiny zombies. There we go, yeah. So these little patterns, I guess, lots of tiny zombies walking towards you in the fabric, which is an unusual, unusual design choice. Now Ford were the best when it came to wacky, useful innovations like the weird joystick thing they used to have for uh, adjusting a speaker output. This one has got a pump up squeezy thing. Now looking up top, it's not an electric sunroof. We do have individual reading lights, but we do have a manual rotative job for the sunroof. First of all, check out this door because it is an estate. We've got very square doors. They haven't done the usual thing of giving us the same rear doors as the hatchback or the saloon, so you've got a slightly weird angle they've had to kind of incorporate into the glass. It's actually a useful square door, so it's nice and easy to get in, but also because the door comes back, they've given us an extra little quarter light in this door behind that glass and ahead of this huge panel here. Now it's climbing in the back, surprisingly plain door card. There's almost nothing in here. Just, just literally just your door handle, an ashtray because the 80s, and a little bit of your zombie velour, and then straight in because that's such a big open aperture, you could just virtually fall in. These were great taxi cabs because anyone could just fall in drunk and not brain themselves. Electric window switches here. Uh, very little else in the back though. We've just literally got electric window switches and a map pocket for, for excitement in the back. I can't even see rear speakers. Am I being blind? No, I'm not. There are not rear speakers I can see. There is, curiously, like a pressing in the ceiling, which looks like it would be a second sunroof, but I can't imagine that's a real thing. Almost a testament to the 1980s-ness of it, and the fact that things were happening relatively fast in terms of car development. We have got rear seat belts obviously because that was like the law but you can still see the bolts on them so it's all you know and visible screws this was how 80s cars were it's funny they were so modern and yet so not at the same time now this is the good bit that 2.9 litre cologne v6 just purrs into life and it's got that delicious growl to it, it sounds amazing now let's see what 148 horsepower and four-wheel drive is like feels good. Feels rapid, not crazy fast, but comfortably rapid. Now, because this is a gear, not an XR car, we've still got the power, the performance, but we haven't got the lowered, perhaps harder suspension. So the car is a little bit soft, because it rolls a bit through the corners. 
but we are still rear wheel drive and two thirds of the power going to the back. So as we hit a corner, it pushes from the back as we expect from a rear wheel drive car, but we've still got that pull from the front. So as we come out of the bend, it's pulling us out like a front wheel drive car, which means it's very fun and very stable and very safe. And if you're road tripping down to Chamonix for the ski season, when you hit the snowy bits, this is gonna give you all the traction and power and control that you need. Perfect. Who needs a silly front wheel drive jacked up SUV with poor body control when you can have something like this? Okay, you might want the slightly improved fuel economy, but that's not important right now. Now the gear shift is typical Ford five speed of the 80s. It's a little bit notchy, it's a little bit agricultural, but it does the job well. And it's easy enough to flick through the gears, a little bit of notchiness in there, but they go in fine and they stay there. And the steering is quite heavily assisted. It feels very light indeed. And the Cologne's not a light engine, so there's a fair bit of weight over the, the front axle. The steering is really very light indeed. Now because the Sierra was pretty popular, it was built in a lot of places, not just the UK, Germany, Belgium, but also all around the world. Argentina, South Africa, New Zealand, they made a lot of these cars, but the, this particular specification though was fairly unusual and pretty rare. It was one of the more expensive ones. The thing is, a couple of years ago, these four wheel drive V6 Sierras weren't particularly popular and you can pick them up for literally pennies. I mean, I looked at a couple of them when they were like 750 pounds, thinking, oh, that would be a fun thing to tuck away for the future. I reckon they'll get valuable at some point soon. Of course, I never did. And now they're going for thousands. In fact, I'm not quite sure what this car's for sale for, but it's, it's more than 750, that's for sure. Once again, I've missed the boat. Now, although the car was very uh, contemporary and modern on the outside, it was very traditional underneath. Front engine, longitudinal, rear wheel drive. In fact, the earliest ones actually used a carryover of the uh, engine and transmission from the old Cortina, which went back to the 70s. The suspension, though, is good. The underpinnings of this car were engineered by the legendary chassis dynamicist and engineer Richard Parry Jones. He is behind a lot of the great Ford drives of the last few decades. He was behind the original uh, Ford Focus, which was, uh, everyone knows, it hails one of the greatest driver's cars of all time, the original Mark I Mondeo, the Puma. He's behind all of these and more. He had his grubby little fingers on the Sierra as well, so though, it is fairly basic, rear wheel drive front engine. McPherson struts at the front, trailing arms with coils at the rear, all independent. It feels really quite grippy. I know the rear wheel drive ones can, can bite you and they can flip you sideways on a greasy roundabout, as any rear wheel drive can do. But the four wheel drive is less prone to doing that because you have got that extra grunt at the front. Four wheel drive was such a status thing in the 1980s after the rally cars like the Audi, stepped up and just showed what it could do. If you were anyone, you had four wheel drive in your performance car. And anyone who grew up in the 80s, that kind of hankers in the back of your mind and you kind of still think, hmm, performance, fast, four wheel drive. You can't get away from it. There's nothing behind us. Should we do a quick brake check? Let's get to 40 miles an hour for a fair, fair brake check and... Wow, that's good. Don't forget Ford were pioneering ABS at the time, so their cars were really well sorted. In fact, you might remember that advert with, I think it was a Granada or, no, it was a Sierra, braking suddenly for the tractor and the ABS allowing it to steer around the obstruction. That was the great thing with the Ford. You got lots of technology, lots of advanced stuff, but for a really quite sensible, affordable price. You know, I, I knew before I got into this car, I was going to enjoy it. And I really, really am enjoying this thing. It's everything I want in a modern classic. It's got the rear wheel drive feel, but I know it's got the security of the front drive. 
which makes it feel just so much more predictable. It's got a huge boot so I can use it for practical purposes if I wanted to go on a, on a classic car holiday with the family and everything, not a problem. But it's got sensible modern stuff, with ABS, the air conditioning, so uh, if I want to cool down, in fact it is quite stuffy today, quite humid, a bit of cooling, that's a good thing. But of course it's from the era when you've just got a good chassis, you haven't got loads of driver aids that are cutting in and making it feel less connected, you are one with the car, even if it is a big family wagon. This is a family truckster that you cannot take the mick out of. There's my camera mount jingling in the background for some reason. In fact, don't bother looking on Percival Motor's uh, website because I've got a feeling this car might not be listed after all because I might have bought it. If you've enjoyed this, please do hit the like and subscribe buttons and the bell notification bang there, down there to find when I'm doing the next review or garage tinkering video. And join me again next time when I'll be driving something completely different.